twice as sneaky and four times as dangerous. And uh, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the last two weeks I have been on vacation in my favorite foreign country, Maine. And uh, <laughs> no, I mean that literally. I think uh, as far as the mainstream of America is concerned, Maine is truly a foreign country. Well, come on in this studio. It's all right. Just come right in here. Uh, Maine is a, a foreign country. Now, uh, I don't want that to be misinterpreted. You know, I, I've come to some conclusions about travel, as, as those of you who have followed uh, this fiasco for the last uh, uh, 400 years know that I'm an inveterate traveler, whatever that means. That means I like to fly the coop and split whenever I get a chance to. But it took me a long time to understand why this is so. Uh, why traveling and getting away and getting into a completely foreign environment is as important to me personally as it is. You know, it, it, there, there's a quick tendency, there's a tendency on the part of every one of us to say, well, you know, you just want to get away. Well, that's not enough. What do you mean get away? Why do you want to get away? That's saying something about what you're at, you know. <laughs> it really is. Oh, boy, Charles, this is great to get away. Get away from what? Well, uh, it's not, it's, it's too simple, really, to say, well, my work. Uh, that means probably you hate your work, which is a bad scene right there. If you're going to spend eight hours a day for 40 years doing some uh, cruddy thing that you hate, well, dad, there's no two weeks is going to help you. That's all. It's only going to make it worse. Uh, in fact, uh, to those of you who have that problem, I recommend don't leave, uh, cause you'll come back and one day you'll go out of the sixth floor, uh, trying to fly. But, uh, to to a person, uh, it's very difficult. Now, I have seen, I have known in my experience, people who have changed their environment. Now, that really is what getting away means, changing your environment. And and when you change your environment, it's like, it's like a bird. It's one of the great things about man that makes him different from other creatures. He is the most mobile, most mobile uh, of of the of the primates he, he literally is uh, it's uh, it's very difficult to get say uh, an orangutan to change his range you do and you've got a, you've got a problem orangutan on your hand uh, it is true he withers and dies on the vine uh, it is a difficult thing to try to get uh, let's say a moose to change his uh, environment oh very difficult they fight like mad in fact I'll tell you one thing I saw in Maine uh, in the past, two. this is a this is a great a, a great difference from Sixth Avenue, uh, and, and yet in the same way, in some way, in a very subtle way, it is exactly like Sixth Avenue somewhere in the forties. I saw <laughs> I'm standing on this uh, the shore of this lake, and all of a sudden I hear a little a little uh, hollering, and a couple of people are saying something. I look down the lake, and there, swimming across the lake in full view of everybody, is a moose. Now, moose are not that plentiful. Uh, to be swimming across lakes in the middle of an American state at high noon, but yet here was a moose swimming across the lake, followed closely by a dog. And the two of them had probably already had uh, put maybe a mile and a half of water behind them, and the dog was barking all the way. Now, uh, the, the moose was at least 19 feet tall. He weighed probably seven and a half tons, or just a shade more than the Cadillac Eldorado. Uh, and he's even has more horsepower than the average Cadillac. He, com he comes out of the water uh, about a half mile away from me, tears off into the woods, and the dog, which was about a foot and a half tall, goes off after him, yelling at the top of his idiotic lungs. Now you can you can closely you can see the close parallel between this situation and Sixth Avenue. Uh, <laughs> I don't have to belabor the point, uh, but nevertheless, uh, this this uh, I, I saw this. And I realized that life is hell even among the, the, uh, the lesser creatures, uh, as far as, uh, the IQ scale is concerned in the mammalian group. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, however, if you were to go to the moose and say, well, you know, what you should do is move, 
Uh, I mean, it is true that this that this idiotic beagle has got some kind of a hang-up about moose. You should move. Well, I don't know whether the moose would move. You see, there's the problem. Man would. In, in the end, man goes. He'll he'll eventually wind up on Saturn. Uh, he, he'll change his range to the point where he has to he has to produce an artificial atmosphere with him as he goes. Uh, sure. What do you think this means when you when you are wearing a space suit and you're in a space uh, some kind of a space vehicle? You're producing an artificial Earth. It's an artificial environment, just like Sixth Avenue or the Grand Concourse or Cleveland. And you take it up there and you set it down on four legs or whatever the spindle is. It'll set down on its in its landing pad up in Mars. And there it is. You've got your own. You brought it with you. It's like if the moose brought seven acres of forest land and set it down somewhere in Pelham and, <laughs> and you know, it proceeded to be a moose. Well, uh, we, well only man can do this. Only man. And, then, and, and yet, strangely enough, only a few men really take advantage of this. Very few men do this. Uh, they value their environment so much, generally, that they are very afraid to make any kind of change, even though it's the limited change of moving over the face of the earth. And for that reason, you'll find that I think what, this is one of the reasons why all the turnpikes everywhere you go have such a vast lure for the true non-travelers. The turnpike is for people who hate traveling. It really is. Uh, because the turnpike reduces traveling to sitting in your friendly car. That's all it is. And, and you see nothing more than that. You could travel from New York all the way to Los Angeles and see nothing but concrete and big green signs that say toll house ahead. And and you could say, yes, I remember going through Indiana. They had this sort of dark green signs. I remember them very well. They had they had blue glass in the turnpike uh, uh, little uh, windows there. And I remember there was a tall, thin man who took the tolls there, whereas, you know, Connecticut has automatic ones. They're way ahead of Indiana. And uh, so, <laughs> incidentally, I, I'd like to point out, if I may, if uh, the sore head in me here, that there is a town now on the turnpike uh, up in Massachusetts, that simply goes by the name of Toll Land. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and I stopped in a, in a Howard Johnson, of course, there, which is the capital of the town. Now, that's where the city hall is. I, I, I stopped there. By the way, their mayor is called Texas Tommy, uh, which is, of course, a specialty of uh, Howard Johnson. And I, I stopped there, and I, I went into the Howard Johnson there, and I says, uh, uh, how do you like living in Toll Land? And the guy looked out at me, and he was wearing those sunglasses, you know, that all turnpike people wear. It's the sunglasses ubiquitous on the turnpike, as the, <laughs> uh, believe me, as, as the, as, as that, as that long kepi used to be among travelers across the Sahara. And uh, it is, it's a symbol. They sell them out there. They, uh, have you ever gone into a, 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 a turnpike, uh, Howard Johnson? They have, they have giant collections of sunglasses there of all kinds, rhinestones. They have the adventurer type, you know, that slant back, uh, and have little fins on the side and all that, you know. <laughs> it's all part of the Buck Rogers world. I, I went into this place and said, I said to the guy, uh, uh, this is Toll Land. <laughs> yeah, the car is going past me. Yes! He's, we pronounce it Toll Land! I said, oh, very good. And uh, you don't you don't pay for lunch there. You just give them the toll. And uh, oh yeah, it's all part of the toll that we're all paying. And by the way, toll is a great word. I suggest you look that one up. That's something that we're all paying. We'll all eventually pay it at the great toll house at the end of the road. And <laughs> isn't that true? Uh, hi George, keeps creeping in here, doesn't it? Uh, however, uh, that that uh, that problem of getting out of your environment so that you suddenly, when you get back, you really see your environment. And you see things which you take for granted uh, suddenly with a new light and only lasts for a couple of days, and you're right back arguing with Mr. Leader again. You forget the whole scene, and you're right back where you started. So it's just a momentary euphoria of insight. So don't think that you're going to bring anything back from Italy that will count more than three days. In fact, I think most, unfortunately, most travelers are uh, hate traveling. And for that reason, all over Europe and in every place uh, that I've gone uh, throughout pretty much of the civilized world, you'll find in every town a little place that is home uh, for every traveler of every persuasion. Believe me, have you noticed that all the Frenchmen that come to town here immediately rush down to these two-bit French restaurants on 49th Street and sit there? 
and drink the same lousy wine they drink back home and, and, and come up with the same idiotic arguments about the Gaul that they come back with in, in Marseille, you know? And, and yeah, oh yeah, we think only Americans do this. Oh, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> why, there are clubs here that do nothing but admit Englishmen. Immediately after they get off the boat, they go right to the club and they sit there with their sundowner in their hand and their, and their cork helmet on their head and they, they relive it. Oh yes, it's all there. And, and it's just less obvious to us, you see. <laughs> it's very obvious when you go to Munich, for example. In the middle of Munich, you find a giant PX where all the Americans are hanging around drinking canned American beer. And one of the wildest examples is to, is to yeah, you think I'm funny? That here you got the greatest beer in the world that flows like rivers all out of Munich, you know. And, and I, I went in with a guy into the giant PX in Munich, and he, he, he went in to buy a beer. That has, it comes in a can, see, and it's, it's a six pack, and on the side of it, it's an American beer, it says made just like the beers in Germany. The classical German beer. <laughs> and he's buying it there. They import it over there, and he drinks it down, he put, I think it's the sound of the can opening he likes. It gives him a sense that it's uh, another psychological problem there, too. The minute they start bringing a Leuvenbroy in, uh, in cans, he might be happier. Uh, speaking of cans, that's another hang-up. If you notice that lately on TV that they're beginning to sell bottles, only they call them the new glass cans. Uh, so, so that's a, that's an involved hang-up. Of course, the word can has had many, many uh, connotations, many uses. It covers many. We're not even going to explain that to you out there in Queens. You just think about it. So uh, it's much more somehow subtly satisfying than the word glass or bottle, as it's pronounced in certain areas of uh, Manhattan here. Uh, oh, yes. So speaking of insight, uh, I am driving along through, through a gigantic, uh, insane Atlantic gale, hailstorm, whatnot, through Maine. And uh, on either side is the primeval wilderness. They really have it there. And uh, you see this giant spruce, uh, this, this uh, evergreen forest. And uh, once in a while, a deer comes shooting out of the woods and wildly goes to the other side. And, say, and they're still as scared as they were the first time they saw a car, you know. <laughs> Dear, uh, they, they never get, they never get used to it. They have that all uh, wild-eyed look, no matter how many times they hop across the turnpike. So, uh, I'm driving along, it's about, it's about 10 o'clock at night, maybe, maybe 11, and, uh, I, I have a radio, terrible radio in the car. And I turn it on, and, and floating through this, this, this strange howling gale is my own voice. And, <laughs> <laughs> it's talking about Sixth Avenue, you see, and and, uh, and here I am, and the wind is screaming up and down the turnpike, and 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 I see, as you always see in Maine, there's little places carved out, uh, just a little chunk out of the woods, and here is a is a miserable looking shack. It's interesting. They're not they're not the classical log cabin, you know. Uh, that if it was, you'd feel better about it. But these places look like uh, somebody has gone around the county and collected a lot of old Pepsi-Cola signs and nailed them together, and uh, they've, they've gotten themselves somewhere, uh, an abandoned Oldsmobile Rocket 88. And the Oldsmobile Rocket 88 has now been dragged to the backyard and is slowly falling. Up. Yes, every one of them has in the backyard a late model car sinking into the mud. This has not changed. The only thing that's changed since my last visit in Maine is that now, instead of one car sinking in the mud in the backyard, most have two, and quite often one's a compact now sinking into the mud, which they've abandoned. So, you know, it's, it's <laughs> we're a two-car junk family. Uh, speaking of junk, this is WOR, AM and FM, New York, and uh, we'll be here uh, till the cows come home. And while we're speaking of cows, do you have the little whoopee thing in there? Speaking of cans, uh, the thing on the list there, you got it there? You better, yeah, there you go. Yeah, just hit it. Yeah, there we go. Speak Hello? of canned beer. Hi, honey. Who is the airman? Canned virility. He could be you, a man with a thirst for a Nothing is more depressing than find a bunch of chicks Nine drinking ale. Three out of four men. <laughs> of course, they all have mustaches. Every time it's choose right. the bolder, keener tasting ale. They wear high leather Russian boots. Valentine's even in the summer. There are men... And there are ale. Men. Yes, that's true. And for an ale man, there's only one ale. That's Valentine. Sad, How limited Bolder, people keener, yeah, more terrible. to the point. Valentine ale. It could make an ale man out of you. What do you say? Who is the ale man? It could be you. A man with a thirst for a manlier brew. Free out of all manlier brew. 
every time and what's milk the boulder keener tasting ale the boulder keener tasting ale valentine have you noticed that so many products today are assigning human characteristics to their product a manlier brew uh, can't you just see this little this little can of beer sitting there growing stubble and, uh, <laughs> you know going out to the ball game uh, a manlier brew yeah, it's funny it's, uh, oh, of course psychologists have known for years that that products do have a, a gender association that you know that there are certain cars certain automobile uh names brand names uh makes which are masculine and some are called feminine cars they that is the definite truth they have a feminine some kind of very subtle feminine connotation i'm not talking about the obvious things like the color of the seat covers or the color of the car i'm talking about the name of the automobile itself the make uh, that there are certain cars that women just don't, uh, when the man buys it, he's making a statement. Uh, <laughs> you know, oh, speaking of making statements, I'm on my way back. I have, I have to finish this story, and I'm coming along through the wind and the howling rain and all the jazz, and I can hear my voice, and it finally fades out, disappears completely. And uh, uh, the, there's another, by the way, another thing, too, about, about finding yourself recorded is that, uh, that you, you, you find yourself arguing with yourself. Uh, oh, yes, it is indeed t- a, a terrible problem. And, and I would suggest that for any of you who would like to get an insight into what sort of adult you really are, uh, just sit down for about an hour and say all the things you think into a tape recorder. And then keep it for a while, about, say, a week. And then uh, when you're having a particularly stressful evening, turn it on and just start playing it at full blast. And you'll know why you're in trouble. It'll come through with startling clarity. <laughs> you yell at yourself, you know. Well, well, it's 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 even more depressing when you're six thousand miles away. And you've tried to escape your atmosphere, your environment, your zeitgeist, and it follows you all the way up in the main. And uh, you can hear it coming in, and it finally fades out. That is the most depressing thing I know of to find yourself fading out. You know, this is a, somehow it's the it's the a foretelling of things to come. You know, and, and you're fading out to what? Nothing. I hear some religious program is sneaking in on me. Some guy out in the in the Middle West is making a pitch for dough, and then and then he fades out, and somebody coming out with a hillbilly record, and he's selling potholders. Well, I mean, and we all came in with an equal shot up there in Maine, so there was no there was no discrimination involved. It was purely on the basis of atmospherics, which, by the way, is also significant. I don't think nature discriminates at all. Uh, I mean, you get a bad knee, you got a bad knee. It doesn't make any difference whether you think beautiful thoughts or not. A bad, a bad knee is a bad knee, and it all works equally on all, all of us, every last one. Well, I'm whistling along through the dark, and all up and down throughout Maine, you see these little niches that are carved out of the, the literally the almost what by by today's standards, by American standards today, it is truly the wilderness. By American standards, uh, it's not by old Maine standards any longer. Of course not. But by American standards, and in fact, there, are you aware that there are large sections of Maine that are still inaccessible by any form of normal transportation? That there's about a third of that state that is not inhabited at all. Uh, that, that if you want to get to certain places, you fly in. You just have to fly in a little plane with with floats, and you fly into this lake and land, and that's about it. And that's nothing there. Howard Johnson hasn't made it. Nothing is out there yet. And there's a vast untapped area for dance halls and beer parlors and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we'll bring it there. Don't worry. And, and so uh, you, there are still signs, though, of of America is everywhere. Uh, it's one thing that has made this country totally inexplicable to other countries is the, uh, you might say, the homogenous quality of it. That if you were to travel in, in Europe, and I speak, uh, you know, this is, this is experience. If you, if you ever travel 200 miles in any direction in Central Europe, you've gone through at least three languages. Uh, the architecture changes, uh, the religions change, even the looks on the people's face change as you go a couple of hundred miles, even sometimes ten miles in one direction. So it's an eerie feeling, you know, to go across a border in Europe. It looks the same, you know, the trees are on one side, and you go and there's a little thing, it's just got a little fence, you know, with white and black markings. It looks like one of these crossing fences at a, at a train, you know, it's down. It says border. Achtung! And you stop. 
Uh, and, and the guy comes over with a uniform with a white braid all over, and he checks your passport. You go, you go into the country, 10 feet, you the next country, and everybody's got a different look on their face. Their eyes are sort of big, wide, uh, big, clunky jaws or something, and a very different crowd. And they have a completely different look. The food tastes different. You get sick a different way there. Uh, everything is different. And, uh, it, it, it just, it's an eerie thing. And so, it, in Europe, of course, this is, this is life. This is the way it is. But you can travel uh, 3,000 miles in America and find the same knotheads all over. You just can't miss. And <laughs> same thing. We're all made. Is it, I, I, what, what did it do? Who knows? There's a lot of things. Uh, the coaxial cable, of course, is the most obvious. Uh, and and I, that's what I was getting to. Here in this darkness, I'm riding along, and I look into this little shack, this little house stuck in the woods there. The, the income of this family is probably about $7 a year. Can't be any more than that. Uh, oh, yes, poverty is rampant in many of the far northern areas. I, of course, most people are aware of that, so that's belaboring an obvious point. Uh, we keep thinking in terms of the of the hills, you know, this West Virginia in this place. But wow, uh, up in the backwoods and in, in the northern areas, that poverty is a tough problem, really, among many people there. Uh, industry is leaving. There's a lot of things about it. But here is this little shack, and I look, of course, every little shack throughout Maine has a gigantic tower that stretches up like a 100 feet in the air, and it has a 17-element Yagi beam up there. Oh, yes, with the, with they, they've, got a, they've got a better element, they've got a better antenna system than most of the top radar reporting stations had during World War II just to get the Beverly Hillbillies. Now, I wonder what a real hillbilly thinks watching the Beverly Hillbillies. I mean, you know, what does he think it is? It had nothing to do with, I don't know whether you know anything about hillbillies, but there's nothing like it. I can tell you, Buddy Epson is not playing a hillbilly. He's playing an actor playing a hillbilly. It's a very different scene. Uh, and, and, oh, yeah, that's different, very different. Just like almost every actor we ever see playing kings is an actor playing a king. Have you ever seen a king? You never saw a weedier lot. I'll tell you, there isn't a Lawrence Olivier in the crowd. But, you know, there they are. It doesn't matter. So I, I see in the darkness there, this little house, and, and I look through, and of course it's made out of Pepsi-Cola signs and Coca-Cola signs and old Ford signs and stuff. And, and there you can see through this little window, you can see that the flickering blue-purple light is on. And you see a couple of huddled heads there looking at this thing. They're in touch with the infinite. Uh, they, they, they are. They're, they're paying obeisance to whatever gods that are out there. And I really don't know what a guy who lives in the middle, it's, there's a strange sense of unreality you get coming from the world where all that jazz originates, uh, that comes down the pipe, down the cable, to the place where people are really living, you know. They really are having trouble. I mean, it's tough to get the bacon there. They've got real problems. Uh, and oh yeah, you should see Saturday night. I, it's, it's, I, I, I would love to do a documentary on the kind of discontent that is going on in little towns in America, that every last chick in America, in little uh, small towns like Waterville, Maine, and so on, almost every last girl that I met in those towns, almost every one is just waiting for that instant when she can cut out and go to New York. Are you aware of this? Has, has anyone done a, uh, a TV show on this element? I mean, on the widespread thing, not just on a girl who wants to come to New York, which is, no, I'm talking about the social discontent that exists among the girls. It's primarily women. They want to cut out, they want to go. Oh, it's a fun. I mean, you can't look at Debbie Reynolds, uh, for, for two straight years without feeling a terrible urge to get away from the YMCA dance on Saturday night. Uh, you know, the, the, the American Legion Hall just doesn't do it anymore after once you have seen, uh, believe me, Elizabeth Taylor on, on TV, you just forget it. And, and they're, they're almost, you just, you can get a girl's attention immediately. This is a tip for any of you, uh, any guy who's going up, you, know, you sit down in, in a joint, a restaurant, this chick comes up, and almost all the waitresses in Maine, in better restaurants, are college girls. Uh, that's one of the best jobs in Maine for a girl. Absolutely. They earn money because the tourists tip. It's like in Europe. Uh, oh, yes, the tourists tip. They make money. Uh, they meet interesting people. Uh, they, they, they get away from, from working down over the, over the sporting goods store, working for old Doc Quimby, who pays $12 a week and you gotta clean his dentures. 
uh, you know, that kind of thing. And so, uh, oh, yeah, that's hometown life. It really is out there. So the chicks are all waiting, the ones I saw. Now, again, I'm going to get 400 letters from angry ladies who are going to say, my daughter doesn't think that way. And, of course, the daughter's saying nothing. She's less like, you know. <laughs> well, uh, you, all you got to do when the girl comes over to your table is uh, you, she she gives you the, the, the water, you know, and the napkin and the little thing, and you sit there for a moment, and you say, uh, how can you stand it here? And she looks at you and says, how did you know? And <laughs> then you're off, you see. You say, well, it's New York. And, uh, of course, they've all got the dream of making the scene in the village. This seems to be the big bit. Uh, wouldn't it be fantastic when all of New Hampshire moves to the village uh, <laughs> and all of the village has got an insane desire to go to New Hampshire and emulate Salinger and write the novel, and all of New Hampshire is populated by village hippies, and the entire village is taken over by bucolic types from Oakland, Maine. Uh, <laughs> look, and they run into nothing but Oakland, Maine types, you know, running in and out of the Rienzi and the, the tourist joints downtown. So, so the, the, the thing, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to be aware of this great discontent that exists. It's, it's an unbelievable discontent. And, and and then the worship on television almost has gone into into a, another dimension. It it, it really it, it is becoming something almost like one of the more uh, esoteric Oriental religions. It's a all it's almost it's a transcendentalism. Uh, they are yes they are transcending their environment completely. In short, sitting in front of the tube is a moment of satori insight. Uh, it is it is a, it is a moment of of uh, of turning your guts inside out and getting away from Doc Quimby, and you're in touch with David Susskind, where people think, you know, <laughs> well, you know, that's comparatively speaking, of course, and uh, and and it it is a, it is a, it is a real hang up out there, and so you you go along and you'll see places that'll say the Beverly Hillbillies Lobster Pound. Uh, oh yeah, they name things after TV shows now. That's true. It's terrible to name your big swinging restaurant after a TV show that goes off the air, you know, like, like the Medic Cocktail Lounge. And it's been off for about six months, you know, and you have little sutures and things that decorate the walls there. It's a, a lot of interesting ideas. And, you know, oh, you can serve your drinks in little beakers and the hypodermic needles, you know, you can put the vermouth in. And, oh, I got ideas. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you wear Ben Casey uh, type uh, doctor clothes or the bartender, and you know, he, he says, "I'll make an analysis of you." He says, "Let's see, uh, I'll make uh, the prescription is two martinis," and he lays it out there. Well, I I want to say this though, going even further about Maine and the coming back, of course, is always a problem. You come back because you see everything uh, anew. Uh, you do briefly. And you see, you see how unreal most of the things that are being done on the air about America are. You really do. For just that brief moment, you hear people being interviewed all day long who have written plays, who have done movies, and it has no relationship at all, none whatsoever, none at all, with the life lived by a guy in Oakland, Maine. None of the stuff they're writing, doing, saying anything. Nothing. What is it? It's become a separate entity in our world. This whole business of showbiz writing, the whole jazz. And you, you find as you get out there that the, that the great problems that, that surge through the minds of everybody up and down McDougal Street and, and uh, over at the YMHA up on 92nd Street has not even touched anybody. <laughs> That's why it, it doesn't even extend. They, they, I'll tell you, the influence doesn't extend 20 feet the other side of the Hudson. You begin to lose it about West Morris, New Jersey. You know, it begins to fade out. It's like there's a big boil going here, and it's New York. It's, you know, the big thing, fine, wild thing. And, of course, it's as though everybody 10 million miles out is plugged into it. And they watch it for an hour every night. It's like watching some kind of a snake or, or uh, you know. And if, for a while, oh, really, you know, you go to Coney Island, you really do. You know, it's like it's like giving yourself up. Uh, you know, when you go to Coney Island and you ride on the on the merry-go-rounds and all that stuff, this is it's a it's an obvious respite from reality and life. Well, that's what television is to people out there where life is going on. I mean, life that is just life. It's it's lived as normally. And when I say lived, it is unselfconscious. Life in New York is exceedingly self-conscious. So it's not lived; it's observed. It's a different thing. 
uh, you watch a rabbit. Is a rabbit living or what? You know, he's just living. He walks around and eats and scratches and does all the stuff. You know what rabbits do. Terrible things. And he fools around and he doesn't write about him. He doesn't make, uh, pull a D.H. Lawrence about the last rabbit he met. He doesn't write a big thing. Lady Chatterley in the bushes, nothing to this. He just goes about his business, does it, walks around and scratches and, and that's the end of it. Well, that's the way they are in Oakland, Maine. You know, they don't worry about it. There's no hang up. I mean, you know, there's the front porch and uh, life is life, you know, and, uh, there are the bushes and that's the way it is. Uh, really, it's, 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 it's a, a very strange difference, but a very important one. So, so a guy sitting out in Oakland, Maine, will say, watching, let us say, uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf going on, which is a typical example of New York, of New York at its best. Everybody's scratching and yelling and hollering. And they're all sitting. I can just see six Maineites sitting there watching this, trying to figure out what they're talking. What's the matter? What's bugging them? <laughs> and it is very hard to understand what is bugging them unless you're right here and in it. If you are here and in it, then you know. It's like we have a secret thing going here in New York. And we all understand it, and we do. We respond to it. Very difficult for a guy living just outside of Presque Isle. Uh, can't you just see old Carl and Mamie? For 47 years, they've been living on the, on the, on the shores of Snowshoe Pond, which uh, has 107 inches of ice beginning in September. <laughs> you know, and the ice goes out about, oh, about the third week in August. Uh, and, 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 you know, you can hear the wailing of the wind out there and an occasional great snowy horned owl whistles past and they're watching Virginia Woolf. Uh, it's, you know, it's a very different world and it is out there. It is out there. Don't put it down and say I'm inventing it. It is there. Uh, for you writers who are interested, it really is there. Uh, and, and sure, if a guy goes up to Provincetown for two weeks, he figures he's seeing the, the provinces. You know, this is, a, this is the writer's way of getting out with nature. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, but I'm talking about out there way back of Bar Harbor. I'm talking out there where, where believe me, where, uh, where, where a big sign for, that says Pepsi Cola for those that think young is a total enigma. They can't figure it out. You know, <laughs> they just like think young, you know. And, and, and there's a six year old kid walking around with a straw hat on his head and a pair of overalls and an 87 year old guy walking around with a straw hat and a pair of overalls and they're both chewing the same bubble gum. And the sound says, you know, scientists think young. Who, who are you talking about? And they walk around. And, and, well, Saturday night, let me tell you a little scene. Uh, the discontent, though, is becoming evident. Uh, it's just like the discontent, the terrible discontent that is felt by peasants everywhere, uh, simple people who have somehow glimpsed some kind of strange right that's being held off in the distance. You find this true in outlying districts in, in Italy, for example. Uh, there is a great discontent often about wanting to get to Rome and be part of, of uh, some big ceremony, some big thing that's happening in the Vatican. It, it, it is a religious thing, you say. It really, really is. It's, it's a terrible discontent to get, get there and go and make the pilgrimage and come back. Go to Mecca. Uh, and everyone today wants to go to New York to make the pilgrimage, to, to go to Mecca. And if possible, take up residence in Mecca. Somehow get the ordained or something and stay here. And become one of the acolytes or something here and stay and, and, and get involved. <laughs> be one of those people that yells at other people and, you know, Virginia will be one of those people with a hang up. A lot of guys are working actively in places like Cleveland on a hang up. It's not easy to develop a hang up. You know, everyone thinks they just come naturally, but believe me, there are guys who are, you can buy even books on it. Uh, you can, you can buy little, little handbooks. Yes, there's, there's so, it's just, are you, are you uncomplicated? I, I, there is such a book that you can buy. Are you uncomplicated? Have you found that you're dull? Have you found that people are not interested because you're not neurotic? That you're not nervous? That nothing makes you jump? Have you found that you dig chicks? There's no problem at all. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so you can, you can take a correspondence course and hang up. Uh, and then you can come back and become a satirist. Make big dough. But uh, that's another problem. Now, by the way, do you know that there is an outfit that is giving now correspondence courses in satire? And I, I, one of the saddest things I have, I'll tell you, how I ever got on the mating list, I, I don't know. It just, just happened. Uh, somebody sends me every week. Apparently, they're trying to get me to subscribe. It's a scary thing. 
Every week, you know that there is a service now that provides topical comments on topical world themes for topical comics on every given category. You get a, And it comes every week, and it's based on the headlines of that week. And what is really scary is to read some of this junk, and the next day, some comic, I, I, I'll get this thing to me, it's sent to me, you see. It's only sent to professional comics. And the next day, Jack Gould or somebody in the Times will say, you know, uh, old Charlie, uh, Charlie the satirist made a fantastically beautiful insight remark last night on the Ed Sullivan show when he said, blah, 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 whoopee, whoopee, cigarette smoking. Wow, laos, uh, Mao Zedong. And, uh, and and and, I, and that I read on the service, you know, it came in this little two-bit mimeograph service from Mountain Queen somewhere or someplace wherever it's turned out, and and yeah, I, I uh, this is true. And you know that 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 many I have seen comics, I have seen guys, I have seen e what is what is even more sickening, I have seen comics who are working in racial themes use this thing. And, uh, and, and get applauded for their great insight. And of course, it's coming off the line. It's coming off of a ditto machine just as much as, have you ever seen in the back of popular mechanics in that where it says, uh, 100, 100 stories, uh, true, uh, guaranteed laugh getters, L-A-F-F. Laughs for all occasions, for speakers, for, <laughs> well, that's what's going on now in the world of satire. You can buy this. You can get the service. And if you, and, and it's all based on, and, and oh, by the way, uh, they can be read either way. They can either be liberal comments or conservative comments, depending on the audience that you're involved in. And uh, yeah, there, there'll be eight takeoffs on Adley Stevenson and seven takeoffs on, on uh, Barry Goldwater. You can just take which one, you know, whatever you, whatever you want. Uh, speaking of, uh, do we have the West thing in there? Speaking of Barry Goldwater, hit that thing in there. The most spectacular epic in American history oh, explodes I... across the screen. Now, MGM and Cinerama present How the West Was Won. Poor Nixon still trying to figure it out. How the West Was Won. Directed by Henry Hathaway, <laughs> John Ford, and George Marshall, with a cast of over 12. Well, you know what happened to him in the primary. 24 of Hollywood's greatest stars James Stewart, <laughs> Henry Fonda, <laughs> Debbie Reynolds, Robert Preston, Carol Baker, John so Wayne, Richard you know, Whitmer, like George Rapport, Carolyn Jones, Eli Wallace, Carl Malden, Lee J. Cobb, Gregory Peck, narrated by Spencer Tracy. He's a Prince Tracy. and Born Pioneer. Pioneer. How the West. Was one filmed in glorious yeah, metro Princeton, color, 32. winner of the Photoplay Award for Best Picture of the Year, and three Academy Awards for its spectacular sound, editing, and original spectacular screenplay. sound. They won an award for spectacular sound. You mean they give they give awards now for just sound, not soundtrack or 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 dialogue, just spectacular sound. Well, <laughs> World War Two wins an award for spectacular noises. Uh, let's see here. We don't miss the How the West Was Won, a showcase presentation now showing at especially selected theaters throughout greater New York. They combed them with a fine-tooth comb. They weeded out the sore heads. And uh, special selection there. <laughs> Imagine them sitting around saying, well, now let's see. Debbie goes over great. Let's support them, Rose. Uh, uh, well, on the, on the subject, though, of uh, of this problem, you see, this, this thing, the homogeneity of our world, uh, and the the, uh, the 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 relationship of you know I meant to do something tonight which I didn't never did get around to do it. That's what happens when you when you go away, you come back with too many things to say. But I want to describe a scene that that I ran into in a little town uh, in Maine, Central Maine, North Central Maine. It was about one o'clock in the morning, and it was a Saturday night. It was actually Sunday morning, and they have a law there. And the law is a law about the sale of liquor on Sunday. Well, uh, this is a, you, just no liquor sold after I think it's one o'clock or something like that, one a.m. And now they, they have state liquor stores throughout Maine. But this is beer I'm talking about. You cannot sell beer in, in a grocery store, wherever beer is sold after one o'clock. Well, uh, Monday, they were having an election there in Maine. And by the way, it's fantastic to, 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 to listen on the radio and hear a guy giving election returns. And it'll say, Charles A. Quimby, running for state assemblyman from the 23rd district, now uh, has six votes for. Uh, Charles L. Watson, running for the same office, has three votes. 
uh, uh, Albert Murphy has won. Uh, so Charles Elm Quimby wins. And, and you can imagine this little town with eight guys. Uh, isn't it terrible to know that three of your friends have voted against you? <laughs> oh, let me tell you, the hatreds are long and da deep and lasting and that kind of a... That's true democracy in action. But this little little tableau, which which uh, I come from a town. I, I've spent time, a lot of time, in small towns in the Midwest. So I know something about small town life. And and I want to describe a scene, that I, the likes of which I've never seen in my life. The, the, I went into this place. All over Maine, you know, they have they have places where they sell pizza. Pizza pie is a big thing in Maine. It's even bigger in Maine than it is in Jersey, if you can believe. But they're real pizzas. They're not frozen ones. Real ones. Fantastic. And they they serve uh, everywhere you go. They serve or sell Italian sandwiches. They call them about 19 different things: submarines, torpedoes, bombs, uh, everything up there. And some of them really are. I'll tell you, your ears burn and everything. But they're eight. They all weigh about eight and a half pounds up there. But you, you, I went into this place at one o'clock. It's a little tiny place. It's about six square feet. And two guys are wildly making pizzas and they're wildly making Italian sandwiches. And out in front, all the local males, the disgruntled local males have arrived in their 46 Mercuries, in their 51 Hudsons, you know, and they're all out there and uh, they've got stuff painted all over the side of them. And they're pouring into this place to buy beer. Guys are buying beer. Give me five dollars of beer. They're, they're piling the beer on. And in three minutes, it's going to close. No more beer. But this is the thing that, 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 that I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe. At least, I would say out of ten guys that came in, right down, I never saw such insane drunkenness in my life. Insanely pie-eyed. The whole, it was like the whole town was drunk. Uh, and they were all coming in, wandering in and out of the streets, yelling and hollering, and, and buying the beer, and, and nowhere could you see a woman. It was just a whole lot of men coming in to buy beer to, to, as fast as they could. And, and, of course, they were turning out the... And, and the guy had one eye on the watch as, as he was making these. And finally he says, no, I'm sorry, it's too late. And one guy had two cases of beer in his hand. He says, I'm sorry, Charlie, I can't take your money. And he takes the beer right away from him, throws it back in the icebox, and the guy's crying. He's standing there, you know, he can seize the whole weekend. He's not going to be drunk. What am I going to do the whole weekend? And, and I, 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 I wonder when anyone is going to do a, a, a real documentary on the, on the peculiar kind of discontent that is settling in on the small towns in America because of the glimpse, I think it's because of the glimpse they see every night of this never-never land that David Susskind lives in. You know, that land where people sit and talk to Sidney Poitier and they're everything, they're very concerned. And, and that I, I, it's a wild, wild uh, sense of, of, of unreality that's beginning to take over. And the stores in these places all have a vaguely TV commercial look about them. Oh, yes, you see endorsements by Buddy Ebsen every place you look. Endorsements by, by Ben Casey. Ben Casey's endorsing Juan Morris, the whole scene, you know. If you're going to amputate your toes, do it with a Ben Casey. You know, that kind of thing. And every, oh, yeah, and, 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 and they, they live in a world that is bounded on one side by Channel 8 and then the other side by Channel 6. And everywhere you can see in those hemlock trees are those long, tall, thin antennas reaching for Parnassus.